and thank you all for coming. Um, tonight we're going to talk about a, a very serious subject, um, the situation that we face with antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Um, antibiotics were once the, the silver bullet that seemed to be able to cure just about everything. Uh, now we look at 23,000 antibiotic-resistant bacterial infections every year. So let me introduce you to our, our, our panelists. Um, our first participant is the director of the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She was a science advisor to President Barack Obama. Please welcome Joe Handelsman. Uh, our next participant uh, is a uh, professor at Rockefeller University, where he is head of the Laboratory of Bacterial Pathogenesis and Immunology. Please welcome Vincent Fischetti. Our next participant is an associate professor of immunobiology and microbial pathogenesis at the Salk Institute. Please welcome Janelle Ayers. <laughs> Our next participant is the Ebnen Associate Professor at Rockefeller University. Please welcome Sean Brady. And finally, uh, the Singer Professor of Medicine and Microbiology and the Director of the Human Microbiome uh, Program at NYU School of Medicine, please welcome Martin Blazer. Uh, so I thought that uh, maybe a way to start would be to, um, to show a video. This was an experiment that was done uh, at Harvard where basically scientists created a sort of a gigantic petri dish, sort of kind of the size of an air hockey table basically. Uh, and they seeded it with bacteria on either side and then basically laced it with antibiotics, um, starting at the edge with pretty mild levels, and then as you go further in, it gets more and more deadly until the central band has a thousand times the lethal dose for E. coli. It's really kind of mind-blowing. We're going to see the bacteria... So uh, just sort of hanging out there. Now they're multiplying. This is sort of time lapse. So when they hit that point, what they're, they're encountering that as antibiotics. And then how are they getting past it? I mean, you can see them. Yeah, it's, it takes a little bit of time. And what they're waiting for is growth of one or a very small number of cells in the population that are already resistant. And so although there were many, many billions of cells crossing the plate, uh, probably one in a million would have resistance to the antibiotic. And so so, they're, once those so start they're dividing and one in a million just happens to gain this power to get past it? Well, they always had the power. It was mm -hmm. pre-existing in the population. But then when the whole population is, the rest of the population is stopped by the antibiotic because they're inhibited by it, then those few that are resistant start proliferating and then they take over. And that's exactly what it, it looks like in similar terms when it's in the body. You know, you take an antibiotic and most of the bacteria will die, but there will be pre-existing mutants in the population that are resistant. That's great. Uh, well, not great, but it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it is definitely not great, Yeah, Carl. No, it is, no, I, no, don't get me wrong. We, we think of antibiotics as, as the sort of this heroic um, triumph of science. Um, I mean, how did, how did we get to enjoy the benefits of antibiotics? I mean, how, how did that begin? Well, it started with a chance discovery from, uh, by Sir Alexander Fleming in the UK, who found a fungus on his plate that was clearly inhibiting growth of Staphylococcus uh, on, on the Petri dish. And he recognized what it was, that this was a compound that was diffusing into the agar and determined that it was what we now know of as penicillin. But it was many years before it could be used in any kind of broad-scale way because he discovered that in 1929, and by the start of World War II, we still were not using antibiotics. Uh, in, in, they weren't in general use. Why not? I mean, you, you discover a drug, you know, put it into practice. I mean, what was they the holdup? They couldn't make enough of it. That fungus produced some, but not enough to go into large-scale production. And so during the war, a scientist named Ken Raper was, uh, worked for the USDA in Peoria, 
and he decided as a war effort to put out the call for penicillin um, producing uh, strains of penicillium mold. So he told everybody in, in Peoria to collect as many fruits and vegetables with that green, blue, fuzzy thing that you see on your bread and fruit uh, to bring those to his lab. And people did, and he had this large collection, and it turned out it was his own technician who has gone down in history as Moldy Mary now. Uh, <laughs> her name was actually Mary Hunt. Um, and she brought in the winning cantaloupe, and it had a, a strain of penicillium mold that produces more penicillin than any other natural strain to this day. Wow. And so they started, they moved it right into commercial production and started pumping out large amounts of penicillin, and they had enough to be able to ship it, the penicillin to the troops in Europe. And so World War II was the first war in which more people died directly of bullets and bombs than of the infections that accompanied them. Wow. So, and then once, once the war is over, then antibiotics start to become more of just a general uh, medicine for the public in general, right? Yeah, and at the same time, there was interest in soil bacteria that produced antibiotics. And, and then after the war, there was just this explosion of knowledge of people culturing organisms from the soil, screening them for antibiotics, and then moving into production. And so we had dozens of antibiotics coming onto the market in the mm -hmm. next decades. And, and Sean, I mean, how would you sort of describe like the, sort of the overall benefit of these discoveries of penicillin and some of these other early antibiotics? I mean, what ha I mean, overall, like you know, in terms of lives saved or so on, what, what are we looking at in terms of the scale of this? I think one of the figures is that penicillin alone has saved 100 million lives. I mean, it's, and that's penicillin alone. Yeah. So if you think about that single picture that Joe talked, you can see it in almost any microbiology textbook. That image is probably saved more lives than anything in, in the history of science. So if, if you want one kind of, kind of thing in your office, you should hang that picture as a scientist because it's made a, a larger impact on human health than anything. But, but that, that whole discovery, even today, we're still using those antibiotics. So, so that's the initial discovery. Then you think about almost everything that came out of what we call the golden age of antibiotics, the 40s, 50s, and 60s. So people were finding things not just on cantaloupe, but in other places. They're culturing soil bacteria largely and finding antibiotics. Almost every class of antibiotics that we use today was discovered in that, that time period. We have relied on antibiotic defense, really, of those molecules and continually using versions of those molecules up until today. And that's why we're in the position we are today. We, mm -hmm. We've largely ceased discovering antibiotics after the golden age, the late 60s, early 70s, because we thought we were done. We thought we had solutions to these problems. That's how good those initial discoveries were, how, how yeah. much of an impact they made on human health. Vincent, what's your sense of like when it started to become clear that things weren't going so well? Like wh when do you think that the sort of the scientific or medical community said, I think we have a problem? Well, that happened pretty quickly. I mean, we were seeing resistant organisms to penicillin early on. It was st it started like a matter of a few years after. No, it was probably a year or two after the introduction of penicillin. Exactly, you already we started have to see early stages of resistance. But you know, it was a, an organism here, an organism there. But it, but it was occurring at that time, mm -hmm. and it's been occurring at, at an accelerated rate uh, since then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so, uh, uh, Marty, I mean, what do you think is uh, what would you say would be like, uh, like one of the main factors that explains sort of how we got to this point in terms of resistance? Like, what are we doing uh, that is res causing all of these bacteria now to be just so uh, dangerous? Yeah. So uh, the short answer is that Darwin was right, <laughs> and, and that is that there is survival of the fittest. It's and it's selection. We we are using antibiotics in, in such magnitude because of the miraculous nature of antibiotics, both the public and the profession uh, says, well, why don't we just treat this person with antibiotics, e even if their symptoms are minimal? So there's enormous pressure, selective pressure of antibiotic use, and it's just, it's just a mathematical certainty that there will be resistance. But it's not linear. It's it's geometric mm -hmm. uh, because of the properties of, of bacteria growing. Yes, Vince. But you have to remember that bacteria come. Most of them come from the soil, and antibiotics are in the soil. So they've learned for millions of years how to deal with antibiotics. So the systems are there. If, as long as you if you've exposed them to antibiotics, those systems become heightened, then become resistant. So they they've seen these drugs or or similar drugs or 
or antibiotics type molecules for, for hundreds and hundreds of thousands and millions of years. Marty, you, you've also um, been uh, uh, talking a lot and writing a lot about the fact that our antibiotics um, are not precision weapons, that you, know, you, you yeah. use them against you know, E. coli or MRSA or so on, but that's not the only thing that's going to affect. Yeah. So, so a antibiotics came of age when we, were, when we were really trying to eliminate these bad pathogens. Uh, but no one really considered what was the effect of the antibiotics on the normal bacteria living in the body, the normal bacteria that we call the microbiome. Uh, but now it's clear that, that uh, when you take an antibiotic uh, for a skin infection or a lung or urinary tract infection, that antibiotic is getting everywhere in the body, and it is selecting for resistant organisms in that body. It's suppressing some organisms, and other organisms are coming up, and maybe some organisms are becoming extinct as well. So these are organisms that we might actually depend on that might be actually beneficial for yeah. us? And, and so, in fact, we know that one of the main defenses against infection are our residual, our normal organisms. They're, they're, they're the Coast Guard. They are uh, protecting against invaders. They don't want to share their turf. And 50 years ago, it was shown that if you pre-treat mice or, or other laboratory animals with antibiotics and then give them a pathogen like salmonella, the, the level of salmonella that it takes to kill the mouse goes down by four logs, you know, by 10,000 folds. Mm. So, Sean, I mean, someone might say, like, well, we have, we have all these gigantic pharmaceutical companies. There's lots of money that they can throw at the problem. You know, there was penicillin, and then there were other things like vancomycin, and, you know, you know science marches on. So, so we've got, like, more in the pipeline, right? That's the unfortunate thing. We have almost nothing in the pipeline. Almost nothing. You, you, can, you, can, you can ascribe that to a number of different reasons. We don't get at a crisis because of one thing. We get at it because many things came together that we probably didn't foresee. One of them being that our first round of antibiotics worked so well, right? That, that golden age of antibiotics when we were describing them. People thought we were done. And so, so over the next ensuing 30 years, antibiotic discovery programs, both in academic and industrial settings, largely shut down. And so there are almost no pharmaceutical industries that are putting at least the effort they used to put in to finding antibiotics. And the second thing is then, if we've been using antibiotics, the same ones for 30 years, it means they don't cost us anything anymore. They're all generic. So you can get an antibiotic for somewhere between free and 20 cents a day in many parts of the world. So now you have an infrastructure that doesn't exist, and you have a financial structure that doesn't support the development of new antibiotics. And so we are, at a certain point, trying to figure out how to restart that pharmaceutical industry and how to make it worthwhile to restart it. And there have to be some major things changed. It's in direct competition with chronic disease, which is much more lucrative for the companies because a drug you take for the rest of your life is obviously going to make them more money than a drug you take for five days and then stop. Right. And so even, even now with the crisis that we all know we're in, very few companies want to move back into that area. And what they're doing is taking a drug that worked, became, the organism becomes resistant, and they just make a modification on that drug. It's cheaper for them to do that than to start from the beginning, and now the bugs can become resistant much more rapidly. Mm -hmm. So they work for maybe a year or two, and then they can't use them anymore. Mm -hmm. Marty? And, and then there's yet another problem, and that is that uh, bacteria uh, don't respect borders. And so uh, what that means is that if, if a resistant organism arises in another country, like India or China, it doesn't take too long for it to come over here. And because antibiotics are so inexpensive, and because people think that they're so miraculous, in many of these countries, people are able to get antibiotics over the counter, no prescription necessary. Uh, uh, parents are giving their kids uh, 10 courses of antibiotics a year in, in some recent studies funded by the Gates Foundation. Mm -hmm. Tremendous antibiotic pressure, very low cost, but somebody's making money on those antibiotics. Resistant organisms are arising, and then they're then they're crossing all over the world. So this so this sort of cheap marketplace of antibiotics over counter and so on is even helping to drive on. Yeah, the, the, the whole antibiotic more. market is broken. Mm -hmm. uh, antibiotics, on, in one sense, are too cheap, and 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 are therefore overused and and abused. And on the other hand, there, there's no incentive to create new antibiotics that we want to keep and put in reserve right. for important infections, which won't affect tens of millions of people, so th there isn't that market. Uh, so the, the, the market, uh, 
the economic model for antibiotics is, is, is just broken. So if you just, just to put numbers on that, right? Yeah. So the, the most recent, uh, they're, they're going to differ a little bit, but let's say the six most recent antibiotics that came to market made about $10 million each last year. Ten, ten million. Each, right? Okay, that seems like a lot of money. But just, let's say you've done all the clinical trials you need, and now you need to synthesize on production scale an antibiotic. It's a $150 million investment, right? And the reason these things make so little money is, is you don't want to use them. You don't want to use them as frontline defense, right? right? You want to put them in reserve until you absolutely need them. And so where's the incentive if, if forget the hundreds of millions you put into development just to make the thing costs you 10 times what you can sell it for, sell it for in a year. We really have to rethink how we, how we market these things, how we as a community decide we're going to put antibiotics in reserve and put an upfront kind of realization that, that these things are there, we need to pay for them as a community because we're going to need them someday. All right, so let's, let's brighten things up a bit by like actually, because you know, you, you folks are actually working on things. So maybe we'll start, we'll start with antibiotics themselves, with new antibiotics, so with Joe and Sean's work. So, so, um, so you've been going back to the soil. I mean, mm -hmm. this, the soil that brought us all these original drugs, you think, you think there are more there for us to find? I do. Uh, so for a long time, I went to other methods for antibiotic discovery, and you'll hear about um, some of those uh, that Sean's developed uh, soon. But the reason I did that was that there were some references from the 90s that said that the, the soil was mined. It was fully tapped. And I've gone back to the data, and I can't find the data. And mm -hmm. so now I question whether that's really true, because in the ensuing decades, my lab just spontaneously discovered antibiotics from novel antibiotics from soil that hadn't been discovered. And we weren't even looking in some cases. And so I, it just occurred to me one day, wait a minute, it's not mined if we're finding them. And so that's the approach we're taking, is going back and asking, what is the frequency of new compounds? There was one paper that said the, the rediscovery rate would be 99%. So if you found 100 compounds, 99 of them would be already known. Well, that's actually not so bad if it's true, because we can look at a lot more than 100 compounds with today's methods. Um, but, but I'm not even sure that that's true, because it wasn't really based on at least published data. Maybe somebody in a pharmaceutical company has the data, but we haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So are there particular places that you like to go look for new antibiotics, you know, particular soil that is you, you, you like, or is it just in your backyard? Well, we're looking a, across the world, so we have a worldwide network of undergraduate students. Who undergraduates? Are, yes, undergraduates who are a fantastic and very creative workforce. So we developed a course that is known as the Small World Initiative, and it's taught in 15 countries and all over the United States. And about 10,000 students a year take the course, and they dig up soil from whatever environment is interesting to them. And they come up with more interesting reasons than I ever would for why an environment is interesting. And, um, and so they have this great variety of soils. They're isolating very interesting antibiotic-producing organisms. And now we have to go into the next stage, which is figuring out what antibiotics are produced. Mm -hmm. So we think that you know, if, if we have 10,000 students, each one gets at least 10 antibiotic-producing organisms per year. That's a lot of candidates, and so if we can crank through enough of them, even if that 1% rediscovery uh, or 99% rediscovery rate is correct, we still have a lot of new compounds to look at. Hmm. So, Sean, um, I mean, what, what kind of approach are you taking to uh, searching for these, for these new antibiotics? So about 20 years ago now, I guess, Joe and, and a, few, a few other people were thinking along these ideas, thinking about, is there a reservoir in soil still of, of, of natural products? And, and the thing that, that percolated to the top of, of the thinking of, of these people was that there's data from even longer ago, maybe 120 years ago, that it appears we don't culture most of the bacteria out of the environment, that actually the bugs we've been playing with represent a small fraction of the bacteria in the environment. So let me ask you, so if you like take a sample of, a, you know, a little sample of soil, um, first of all, like how many microbes are in there, and how much DNA are you talking about that you're looking at from all of them? So it depends on whose numbers. Let's say there's thousands, maybe 10,000 different microbes, of which we culture about 1%. Um, just 1%? Just 1%. And, and again, people have done better nowadays, but, mm -hmm. they, 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 um, but they don't solve the other problem, which is even if we can culture bacteria, we don't turn on their genes. Right? So even if you can bring bacteria in the lab, they don't know how to turn on the genes they're going to make antibiotics for us. 
And so, so what we want to do is just look at their DNA. And you can get huge amounts of DNA, at least on the context of molecular biology, out of a single kind of gram of soil. And so it's the coming together of this idea that we can't culture bacteria, we can sequence their genomes, and we can, we can mess with genes, right? Genes in ways that we can turn them on that really allows you to untap this reservoir that's been, that's been un or tapped or untapped. In the mm -hmm. so, so, Vincent, I wanted to, to kind of shift gears here and look at a, a way of dealing with bacteria that's totally doesn't involve antibiotics at all. Right. Um, there's, and this is, this is kind of a long-running idea of basically sending uh, the enemies of bacteria against them. I mean, can you sort of explain the idea of, of the, the, this kind of approach, what was sometimes called phage therapy? Well, phage therapy actually started before antibiotic therapy. So um, it was discovered by Tort about 100 years ago. Discovered a, he had a, a vessel and he, he it was cloudy with bacteria and suddenly it disappeared, just disappeared in his eyes. And he said, something's in there that killed the bacteria. Figured out that it was, it was a virus a virus that only infected bacteria, bacteriophage, it's called. And um, that started a revolution at the time to use phage to, to control infection. It was well before antibiotics. So these viruses, they're, back, they're known as bacteriophage. Bacteriophage, they're phage specific. So, so what are we looking at? So, so the blue thing is, is bacteria. The and blue thing is the bacteria, and the, the ring around that is the cell wall. Now, the, the bacteria, when it attaches, it injects its DNA into the cell. And once that DNA gets into the cell, it takes over the cell for the production of new virus particles. And once those virus particles are, are produced, the phage have a problem. They have to get out of that organism. And they solve the problem by producing an enzyme called the lysin that, that drills a hole in the cell wall. And since the pressure inside the bacteria is greater than the external environment, the organism explodes and releases the, ba the bacteria phage that have been produced in the environment, and that's phage therapy, using those phage to kill the organism directly. What we've done <clears throat> is now <clears throat> taken that enzyme, the specific enzyme that drills a hole in the cell wall, we can produce it recombinantly, and when you add that enzyme externally, it does precisely what it did from the inside, drills a hole in the wall, membrane externalizes and kills the organism. <clears throat> so we've developed the enzyme that, that the phage now uses to, to release its progeny phage. You could use phage themselves, and that's called phage therapy, as a means to control bacteria, but you can use the enzyme to, to accomplish the same thing. I mean, there are particular species of phages that can go after particular species of bacteria? Correct. They're very specific. Uh, that's the problem with phage therapy, is that they're highly specific for the organism that you're going after. Mm -hmm. so, that, so in order to kill, for instance, a Staph aureus, you'll need to uh, produce a cocktail of maybe five or six or 10 or 15 phage to get around the chance of organisms becoming resistant mm -hmm. because the bacteria become resistant very rapidly to phage. So they're getting resistant to the phages as well as antibiotics. They're just evolving but that's, like crazy. But that's the normal system. Uh -huh. The phage are trying to get into the organism. The bacteria are trying to keep them out. So that balance has been going on for a billion years. Nobody wants to win that war. Phage don't want to win, because if they win, all is gone. If the bacteria win, well, they can't get enough DNA into them to, 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 to modulate their, their, uh, their DNA themselves. Right, because bacteria are taking in They're DNA. They're taking from in the DNA, environment. and so they need that, 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 that acquisition of phage mm -hmm. DNA that doesn't kill them that allows them to pick up genes that they, allows them to survive much more rapidly. So then there's this molecule that phage make, this enzyme called lysin. Right. And so you want to just try just using lysin rather than the whole virus. Yep. Um, We've been using lysin for almost 20 years now. And, uh -huh. um, we have lysin. And the, the beauty of lysin is that they're very specific for the organism. We don't see resistance. We've never seen resistance. We've been doing this for 20 years. They, they cannot become resistant to lysin because they'd have to remodel their cell wall. So it would take them a very long time to become resistant, probably hundreds of years before they become resistant to actual lysins. And I think we have a video actually showing. Those are anthrax organisms, and we've added lysin to them, and you can see what happens to them. This is real time. They just explode <laughs> and disappear. 
So you can take 10 million organisms in a test tube and add a five, few micrograms of lysine, within a couple of minutes, they're gone. So uh, it works quite well. We have enzymes, and they're quite specific. So you're, you don't run into the problem, the antibiotic problem, where you kill everything, your normal flora and the, and the organism you're trying to kill. They're quite, so you, this, the, anth, the, the, the staph enzyme will kill staph. Mm. Anthrax enzyme kills anthrax. So you, you're, you're targeted killing. You're not affecting your normal flora. So um, why isn't everybody using license? So, I mean, what's the, what are the challenges that you well, still face? We're in clinical trials right now. You are. Phase two. Okay. Uh, phase one showed that it was quite safe. Uh, we're in phase two in the hospitals, about 117 patients. We should be done by the end of this year treating MRSA infections um, uh, and endocarditis, MRSA septicemia and endocarditis. So these are heart infections? Uh, heart valve infections and, and septicemia, bacteremia. And we'll know by the end of the year. Uh, so uh, Janelle, I mean, you had touched on this earlier about, um, you know, maybe paying more attention to our own sort of host health uh, in terms of dealing with these infections. And, you, you know, you're, you've been doing a lot of research in, into, into tolerance. Maybe you could sort of describe sort of the overall idea that you're pursuing and then how, it, you know, what, how that might translate into an actual treatment for, for a patient. Sure. Yeah, so I think the, the, uh, what is evident to me with our perspective uh, in developing antibiotics and antibiotic history and the approaches that have been described uh, by my fellow panelists is that they're all based on the, the question of, uh, of how do we kill microbes and developing uh, ways to kill microbes. And um, we are approaching this from a different perspective. We um, actually want to understand what it takes to enable a patient to uh, return back to a healthy state and to survive uh, infectious diseases. And um, there's, we, I talked about sepsis and how in sepsis, uh, and this is the case with other infectious diseases as well, there's significant physiological damage that occurs and uh, that leads to physiological dysfunction. And in order for a patient to return to a healthy state and to survive an infection, they have to be able to, you have to be able to alleviate that damage that's occurred um, and, and restore the patient back to uh, normal physiological function. And our assumption is that if we just kill the pathogen, we should be able to do that. But that's uh, not necessarily the case. Um, you can have patients where antibiotics are effective in them, but the physiological damage that they've endured um, kills the, the patient anyways. And um, so there's, we are um, taking a, a variety of approaches to understand um, if our body encodes ways to um, protect us from infectious diseases by uh, promoting health and alleviating physiological damage. And about 10 years ago now, we discovered that in addition to our immune system, which protects us from infections by killing uh, pathogens, we've discovered that uh, we encode a distinct defense strategy that we call the cooperative defense system. And this is a defense system that um, is essential for us to survive infections. And it protects us by executing what we call um, tolerance mechanisms or disease tolerance mechanisms. And these are mechanisms that our bodies encode that um, alleviate physiological damage during um, microbial interactions. And so these are mechanisms that promote our health without killing um, the pathogen. So you can induce these um, tolerance responses in um, a, a host, and um, they will be perfectly healthy and survive the um, infection despite having the pathogen present in their body. Um, and we like this approach because this provides a new avenue for treating infectious diseases that will um, enable us to promote survival of the patient. But they also, um, in theory, should be uh, what we call anti-evolution proof, meaning that pathogens should not evolve resistance to such strategies because we're targeting the, the patient and the physiology that's affected by the, um, the infectious disease without having a negative impact on microbial fitness. It almost sounds like the microbiome is, is so, so complex with hundreds or thousands of species that how would you ever disentangle it well enough to be able to, to make it into medicine? 
you, you have to have a hypothesis. You have to conduct clinical trials. Yeah. Clinical trials have advanced cancer therapy. They've converted HIV infection from a lethal disease to a, a, a completely treatable disease with long-term step-by-step clinical trials. That, that's what the field needs. Of course, that's what we need in, in, to, to restore, to have working antibiotics, uh, to develop new antibiotics as well. Yeah, Sean. So we, we do similar things with the human microbiome that do the soil, as we look at the molecules that these bugs make, and we've in fact found antibiotics that are effective against MRSA. So these are, these are antibiotics made in the R bacteria living inside of us. Coated by the bacteria living inside of us. So we're sort of antibiotics factories. Yeah, we, yeah, we I mean, may not need undergraduates anymore. We, <laughs> we may just have to mine our own uh, microbiome. Mm -hmm. Or okay. the undergraduates. <laughs> <laughs> even, yeah. even better. Yeah. <laughs> but to add to, to add to the complexity, we also have bacteriophage in our gut, and they are modulating so the organism. So the fa we have phages that are attacking our bacteria inside of us all the time. We eat, drink phage all the time. Mm. 10 trillion phage pass through our gut into our tissues every day. Every day? Every day. Wow. So they're everywhere. There's 10 to the 31 phage on Earth. So they're everywhere. We eat, drink phage all the time. So they're in our gut. They're modulating the organism up and down. So you have a bloom of phage, and they are killing a particular organism. You have a reduction in, up in that organism. We don't know what physiological effects it has on our bodies, but it has to have an effect. Yeah. And, and understanding the modulation of phage in our gut flora is, a, is another area that people are starting to mm -hmm. look at. And then Janelle, like the, the, your own body is then responding to you know, all these different things going on inside of you. I mean, Absolutely, it's a bi-directional uh, relationship. So um, we're, we're recognizing uh, the microorganisms that are in our intestine, um, but also some uh, microbes induce host responses or immune responses to, that are not effective against themselves, but will be effective against other microbes within the community. So um, through this bidirectional communication, it goes back to Ecology 101. They're, they're using the host to also shape that ecosystem. So um, I'm going to open it up to questions in a little bit, but uh, before I do that, um, I just wanted to, to get a sense from all of you about um, sort of the human side of all of this. I mean, we, we talked about how the industry incentives are all quite perverse, and um, you know, and they're, you know, they, it takes time and effort to find these antibiotics or to develop these other alternatives. So um, are there... Do you see changes in, in a good direction in terms of, of, you know, creating a sort of these scientific or social uh, customs or, or, or procedures to, to help get us towards this better situation where you might use the, these things? I mean, or are we just going to, you know, like not be able to, to find, you know, these replacements because there is enough support for it? I mean, Marty, what do you think? Uh, uh, the, the bottom line is that we need to be better stewards of antibiotics. Uh, we could create 10 new antibiotics or 10 new licenses, but unless we use them better, uh, the, you know, uh, the resistance uh, uh, will get to us. The, the bacteria are, are selected for resistance. So we're, we have to reduce the variation in antibiotic use. They're using antibiotics a lot less in Sweden than they are here. People are just as healthy as we are here. There's a lot of regional variation in antibiotic use, this variation from doctor to doctor. We, the, the practice, the public have to be better stewards to understand that antibiotic use has cost. We're using it as if it had no cost. So you, you think that we could, even now, I mean, like not even talking about th these uh, amazing possibilities that we've just discussed, you think that we could reduce the amount of antibiotics that patients are taking and still be That will help us. That will decrease them? the pressure. You know, right. w one of the questions is, why did C. diff move out of the hospital into the community? Why did MRSA move from the hospital into the general community? We, we might be able to get it back in. Right. So, Janelle, you were just nodding before. I mean, do you think? I think there's some great uh, data from antibiotic clinical trials from 1920s and 1930s where uh, with certain uh, trials, the, the group that received the placebo, 80% of them did just fine. We can 
uh, clear infections on our own. We can survive infections on our own. Um, and I think a lot of times by the time a patient shows up to the clinic to get the antibiotics, um, they, there are studies to suggest that they've already cleared the, the infection and now they're just getting antibiotics because they have uh, some residual symptoms from the infection. So I completely agree with Marty that if we can just temper our use of current um, antibiotics, that will help significantly. And what about, um, I mean, you, Sean, you were just talking about like um, how much money uh, a, an antibiotic might make and how much money is required to do it. So like, how do you, how do you, even, how do you get those thing, numbers to balance out? I, I, th I think the, the, the good thing is we've seen this tremendous effort in the past decade to try and solve the discovery problem. We still need more money there, but we clearly see there's a global impetus to say we need more antibiotics. Maybe there, I think there are 50 recognized major efforts in the past decade to, to support antibiotic discovery in, internationally. Um, so I, I see that's going in the right direction. I really do. I don't know that it's going to happen fast enough. We'll ever get enough money, but that's in the right direction. But it's the post-antibiotic issue, not only our use, but how do we market it? How do we, how do we let those things survive? And I still think we have a lot of hard thinking to think about how we're, how we're going to do that. And I don't think we have, we have a solution. Hmm. We have great examples we can go to. There are lots of things that countries do to put things in reserve. You can say our army is in reserve until we need it, right? We pay a lot of money for that. Why not think of same models for antibiotics, that we have them developed, they're in reserve, we pay for them prior to their use, b before we need them. I mean, there's a lot of thought that has to go into that, but to me, that's where the gap is at the moment. Mm -hmm. We need more money for, for, for development of antibiotics, we see money flooding in, we still need more, but there's really still this question of, of how do we use them afterwards and how do we finance them that, that, that worries me. What might help is the, the fact that um, what we've been using for years and decades are, are, multi, are uh, broad spectrum antibiotics, and they're killing everything. And the reason for that is when you, if you're sick, you go to the hospital, and the clinician needs to know what he's going to treat you with. If he doesn't know the bug that's causing the infection, he has to give you something that's broad spectrum. If we had diagnostics at the bedside, so if someone comes into the hospital and we know exactly what organism is causing the infection, you can treat with an antibiotic that is specific for that organism, would have very little effect on your normal flora. But we're not at that point. We're getting close. The hospitals now can identify the organism fairly quickly. But fairly quickly meeting what hours. kind of time scale? Okay. Hours. So we're at hours from days to hours. So and if, that, if you can do that, then you have antibiotics that are more channeled to the organism that you're killing, which would cause less side effects. And I think that, that might be a way to, to survive this type of, of, of uh, issue that we're having right now. But, and then what about sort of uh, th these um, less, con we'll call them less conventional things like phage therapy or using license or so on. Um, do you, like, in terms of getting like uh, regulatory approval for these things, do you, do you, do you think that uh, that is able to move forward quickly enough or, or, or are we, do we need a, a better way to sort of like ha take in new ideas and try to get them approved to be used? Well, license therapy has been quite, quite successful in, in moving through this, the system. Phase therapy has an issue. Because phase therapy is, is a concoction of, of many phage to control a, a particular infection. And since you could make a cocktail, I can make a different cocktail to cause the same infection. There's no IP, so there's no inf incentive mm -hmm. to develop phage therapy. Mm -hmm. it, it does work to some degree, but there's no incentive there. But if you have a, de a defined molecule, then the, I think that the pathway to get it out, uh, out the door is, is, is quite good. Right. So Joe, I'm just curious, are you, when you look ahead 50 years, um, do you see the, the sort of the dark picture that we cast earlier, or do you, are you optimistic? I mean, what's? I'm always the optimist, okay. but I also have to be tempered by the fact that we developed a plan for antibiotic development and stewardship when I was in the White House. And there were some really simple things in there that could have been done, like uh, stewardship of antibiotics in hospitals. So CDC has an eight-point plan of what hospitals are supposed to do. We found that only 50% of hospitals in the United States follow that very, very simple plan 
like having a strategy for antibiotic use in the hospital, training personnel in antibiotics. It, it was really kind of depressing and appalling. Um, and we you know, identified all the things mentioned here and then many others that we need to <coughs> steward the antibiotics, use them less, have better diagnostics so that we know when to use them. And we don't even use the tools today that we have, like diagnostics. I've, I've done this survey, it's completely unscientific, I shouldn't even talk about it, but it's my little way of keeping tabs on the docs. I ask in my lab when people go for a, a sore throat, go to the doctor, what do they do? And 10 years ago, there was never a test, they just gave them the antibiotics in every case. And then slowly, we started seeing the strep test, strep throat tests being used, but even today, fewer than half are getting a test before they get antibiotics. That just seems irresponsible to me. Any guesses why? I mean, Mark, why do you, I mean, you're a doctor, I mean, why, why I mean, what? It, it's, it's, <laughs> a, it's a problem of transparency. The medical profession and the public overestimate the benefit of antibiotic, mm. and they underestimate the cost, the effects of antibiotics, mm -hmm. and so, uh, we, we, have, we have to fix that, and I, I really agree about narrow-spectrum antibiotics. Uh, you know, and, and as I said, antibiotics are, 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 are falsely inexpensive. Why, why give someone a $500 or $5,000 antibiotic when you can treat them with a $5 antibiotic? So the market's broken, but we need to use tax money, just like we need to use tax money to buy interstate highways. Uh, that, that's a public, antibiotics are a public good. We, we have to invest. In, in, in antibiotics that will protect uh, our future uh, as, as a public good. Great, okay, so um, it, we have microphones. Uh, question right in the back there. Um, I just have two quick questions. So first one being, so how advanced and what, are the, what is the percentage accuracy on these diagnostic tools? Can they either be improved or is it just because these current antibiotics are so cheap they're just not getting that much visibility? And my second question is, are there currently government programs that are in place or in the pipeline? And the reason I ask this is because there are orphan diseases out there that don't have a large market either, but yet there are a lot of government programs that incentivize the innovations for the space. So I'm wondering if that's something that's happening in the pipeline right now that will encourage innovation in the space. Great, so let's, uh, let's, so they, let's take these one at a time. So Vince, maybe you could uh, start us off in terms of the diagnostics. Is it just a case that um, we already have really good diagnostics because they're just not being used enough, or is there a possibility to develop new kinds of technology to really get these things identified fast? Well, right now they're doing it by DNA analysis. So, so how does that work? You just get a, a, a number of organisms, a few organisms from a swab, mm -hmm. and they can take it and put it, uh, extract the DNA, and put it through a machine, and identify certain genes that certain pathogens have. And they can do that within hours. Sometimes they'd have to grow the organism very for only a few generations to get more organisms so they can extract more DNA. But it's quite, quite accurate. It just takes a little more time. You, it's not at the bedside. It's a few hours, but it's better than what we used to have. It's overnight. We'd have to culture it, let the grow, organism grow overnight, and then even another test, usually two days, before you get the identification. When you say at the bedside, are you saying, I mean, like, you know, a doctor comes or a nurse comes and, like, takes your temperature at the bedside, takes your blood pressure at the bedside? Are you saying you Well, like a rapid strep test is, a sense, at the bedside. Mm -hmm. You can swab the throat and put it into a, a solution that, that digests the organism, and they have an antibody that identifies a, a, a molecule on that organism. You could do that within 20 minutes. You get the results of that experiment. That's at the bedside. We're not there yet, but we're close. And are hospitals like, a, are the, how, I mean, you, I, I, it sounds from your, from your uh, survey, I would guess that maybe hospitals are a little slow to really snap up these, the, the best of these diagnostics. I mean, oh, no, it, they're, 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 they're used. They, just, are. they are, yeah, definitely. Some are, and then some aren't. Yeah. Just like the, the simple practices to reduce antibiotic resistance, yeah. which don't cost any money in, in most cases. Some adopt them and some don't. Yeah, and Marty? I mean, most antibiotics used in the United States in most countries are used in outpatients. They're not used, so the, the focus, 90% of the antibiotics are used in outpatients. 90%? Yeah, and, and most of the antibiotics are used for upper resp respiratory infections, which we know that a big fraction are viral and are not bacterial at all. So viral infections don't respond to antibiotics. So we need 
a rapid diagnostic that will tell whether that outpatient walking in has a viral infection or a bacterial infection. So like if we had, in the doctor's had office tool, as well. Hmm. We had that tool, we could eliminate a lot of unnecessary antibiotic testing. One of the problems is that the antibiotic costs $5, the test might cost $500. So our <laughs> health system uh, isn't, it, it, it's, it's not working. Ah, okay. So after we get fix the antibiotic problem, we'll fix the healthcare system, right? <laughs> or first, one of the, at the same time. Anyway, um, the second question was about what, what are, what are there, are there any special uh, government programs that are actually like trying to, to um, push, uh, you know, uh, research about resistance forward? Um, what, what's happening? So, so as, I, as you mentioned, I'm, <clears throat> I'm on this uh, uh, commission that uh, that Joe was involved in setting up uh, called PACARB, which is uh, President Obama set it up by executive order, and and our mandate is to combat antibiotic resistant bacteria, and we have five different uh, areas: uh, surveillance, stewardship, new diagnostics, new therapeutics, and, and international efforts working with other countries. So, as as part of these and and the executive order. Uh, monies have gone into something called BARDA, which is to develop new antibiotics, to put money in, to make it more economically viable to develop antibiotics, to look at antibiotics like orphan diseases uh, as well. There, there are special uh, uh, stipulations that make it more attractive for companies to, to make uh, products for orphan diseases. Great. Any more questions? Um, is prevention still a big thing uh, in terms of the washing of the hands thing? Okay. Is that still the best we can do? <laughs> I have one little version of that. Uh, I try not to touch anything when I go to the men's room. Does that work just as well? <laughs> <laughs> so soap and water works. There's no question. Uh, but on the other hand, there are all these antibacterial products uh, that are killing the good bacteria. Good bacteria help protect us against the bad bacteria, against the invaders. So are they doing more good or good, doing more harm? I don't know. So these, <laughs> right, and I don't know either. These, these things have hardly been tested, and the people who make them aren't particularly interested in testing them. So we, we, should, we should just uh, talk a little bit about, I mean, we've talking a lot, been talking a lot about the gut, but the skin is, is covered in bacteria, right? Mm -hmm. Hundreds. Mm -hmm. uh, like, and it's a completely different flora than we have in our gut or our mouths or our ears. In fact, the two hands differ left and right. So, um, and are they, are they, are they doing, are they doing good things for me right now? Yeah, they're protecting your skin, just like they protect any surface they're on. They're good guys. You have to get used to this respect for the microbes yeah, thing. Okay, okay. Now I can handle this. Um, and so, so if you use these uh, the sort of hand sanitizers with the antibacterials, they're the, just, they're just... There are times to use them. In the hospital, it's very important to use them because you have a lot of bad bacteria transmitting in hospitals. So washing the hands in, in a variety of different ways is important. And during flu season, it's very important because flu is transferred by people's hands. But if you take all that collectively, maybe that's 3% of the time. Uh, uh, the other 97% of the time, uh, the benefit is just leaving our microbes alone. I think uh, the biggest thing any of us can do is uh, treat our flu uh, symptoms very respectfully. Stay home, uh, not so you don't transmit it. Wash your hands with soap. Purell won't help with flu but uh, that much, but you certain, uh, well, yeah, get, get, what are you saying? Get the shot. Oh, yeah, get a vaccine, that's right. And because I think more antibiotics are given for flu-like symptoms that turn out to be viral, but we don't have the test to prove that, um, than probably any other disease. So I think if we kept the flu under control, and that can be controlled just by behaviors and washing hands and breathing in people's faces. Went out? <laughs> Uh, usually November or December till uh, early March. Vince? You have to realize that 90% of infections come in through the mucous membranes. They're not coming in on your hands. They're coming in through your mucous membranes, your eyes, your, uh, uh, your genital tract. So when you touch something that's contaminated, you're not getting infected through your skin. It's when you touch your nose or you touch your mouth that the organism then gets in. That's how it gets in. You have to have a wound. Your skin is well, an excellent you, yeah. barrier. The only other way is a wound. <laughs> Resist. <laughs> You're bringing the organism from 
whatever, whatever you picked up and you touch your nose. And how many times do you touch your nose and your mouth? About 12 times an hour for the average person. Exactly. Wow, wow. In the back there? Because you were using bacteria, um, no, because you were developing and, uh, what do you call penicillin and all, which came from soil bacteria, and therefore the soil bacteria had natural built-in resistance to the compound you were using. Um, question, is it possible to synthetically generate um, proteins or protein analogs which would bind to sites or would interfere in, in other ways with mechanisms for which things have not developed resistance to because they, weren't, they aren't actually naturally occurring mm. uh, equivalents of penicillin? Yeah, that's actually an interesting point is that I, I think they've done studies, right, where like they would look at old soil mm -hmm. and actually actually find that there were some resistance, resistant mm -hmm. microbes like before the invention of antibiotics, right? That's right. I, they're all over. My, my group has studied a site in Alaska that's essentially as pristine as you can find a site on Earth and it has very little exposure to antibiotics, and we find a, a large array of antibiotic resistance genes. We also have found that when syn purely synthetic antibiotics have been introduced on the market, uh, resistance has developed even faster in some cases mm. than to the, the naturally occurring ones. Penicillin's been on the market for, what, 60 or more, 70 years, and it's still useful. Some of the, the synthetic antibiotics can't even be used anymore because there's so much resistance. So we're dealing with evolution. I think that's the answer to the question of why there's no universal cure or prevention, because we're dealing with evolving organisms. So I guess the lesson is that bacteria are pretty awesome. They really are. Yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, give a hand for our panelists. Thank you for coming.